in association with Kemsa. Yes, it is Health Diary. My name is Gladys Gashanja and we're coming to you from the Gramo Suite here in Nairobi. Now, just the other day, I asked somebody what they think dyslexia is and it was interesting. Their first reaction was, is that that condition where people read things backwards? Well, that is one of the myths we'll be basting in today's episode and also we shall endeavor to understand this learning disability that affects one in every five people. But before we get to it, here now is a fact of the matter. Dyslexia is a specific learning disability where those with this condition have trouble reading accurately and fluently. They may also have trouble with reading comprehension, spelling and writing. Children have a 50% chance of having dyslexia if one parent has it and a 100% chance if both parents have it. Though dyslexia impacts learning, it's not a problem of intelligence or due to a mental disorder. One can live a perfectly normal life with treatment, but this condition can't be cured. Some of the world famous and successful people who are or were dyslexic include Richard Branson, Albert Einstein, Whoopi Goldberg, former President George W. Bush and Steven Spielberg. I've had struggles all my life that uh, made me feel very dumb and and also in Form 1, when I joined Form 1, uh, I remember first time my composition was really bad. So the teacher uh, took my composition and said, Candy Kamanja, beauty with no brains, listen to what she writes and then he read my composition out loud in class putting all my spelling mistakes on the board. Of course, my classmates really laughed at me. And that, of course, crushed my self-esteem. And you can imagine after that, I, I, was, very, I, was, I was very dimmed. And then uh, that's why I managed to get a B minus and uh, I joined Kenya School of Monetary Studies to do a diploma in banking. So I man managed to get a uh, a second upper in, in Bicom Finance at University of Nairobi, and I started looking for a job. Now I got uh, three job interviews, all in banks, uh, but I never passed, I never got past the oral interview. And so, because again, of my challenges, the auditory processing. So sometimes you will say a word, but it doesn't come to me as you said it. So I might mistake it for another word. So that what gives me issues with, with the processing that information. So I used to debate on where I can get help. And, and remember, it's not something I had shared with anyone. Uh, until I found out last year that what I have is called dyslexia. That's when now all my fears like evaporated, like now I started living my life. The problem right now is even the teachers who are handling these children don't know what is dyslexia. So when you don't know, you still mislabel this child as being lazy or not working hard enough. Because these kids, some of them are so articulate, they sound so intelligent, but ask them to put what they're telling you on paper, you'll, you wonder, is this the same person who is writing like this and talking like that? So if that is tackled early, then if it's mild, it can be done away with. But if even the severe ones are not so, the, the severity can be, can be reduced, yes. So let's take time to understand what dyslexia means. It is a learning disorder, but beyond that, to many, it is not known. So to help us do that, definitely with me, Dr. John Oma Onala. He is a consultant in developmental and learning disability and Lena Kivuva, who is a caregiver to a nine-year-old daughter who has dyslexia. Thank you for joining me. Now, Dr. Terry, what exactly causes dyslexia? Dyslexia tend to run in families. So you find 
a big number of uh, children born with dyslexia and you can trace a female family members with the condition that means that it can be inherited uh, the other thing is that we have quite a number of environmental factors that we need to consider uh, things like premature low birth weight maternal emotional condition if maybe uh, mother, uh, the child's mother was unwell, mm -hmm. was uh, going through emotional challenges. Those can be factors. But we, add, we have other factors like faulty learning in early years. You, let's say you take your child to a school and the school keeps changing teachers. Uh, we get teacher A, then we get teacher B, we get teacher C, and they all come in with different teaching methods. And that confuses the child. Then the child will show symptoms of dyslexia because of faulty learning, but some of those symptoms might disappear with intervention mm -hmm. as the child moves on. Okay, now Lena, for you, your yes. child is nine years old. Yes. When was she diagnosed with dyslexia? Um, sometime last year, she was about eight years old, mm -hmm. and um, we noticed that she couldn't read like bigger words, like five-lettered words, some four-lettered words. Earlier when she went to school and they are getting to learn sounds, it was easy and you couldn't pick it. And then later, you're trying to read a storybook. You can tell she's mastered some words, and she can skip some lines. And then um, when it comes to bigger words, she can even read a word that is not there. And you're wondering, where did you pick that from? Yeah. And at some point, um, you'll see they'll also like rub their eyes. They'll want a bathroom break when they're reading. They'll not want to read for long. And um, initially we thought, you know, you tend to think the child is lazy or they don't just to concentrate and read. Also concentration is poor. And then I came across a, 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 a documentary on dyslexia. Mm -hmm. And that, the dad also on a magazine on dyslexia. And that's when we got to know this could be it. Now, there's some just from the get-go, they can tell from something is off when they join school. Mm -hmm. So what makes the difference? Is it the severity of the same or is it the exposure to school? What makes the difference? Severity can be a factor. Uh, some children will be picked from day one. They join school, they have speech, but they keep mixing words. So they're telling a story and the story is jumbled up. Uh, they take long to learn their basic sounds. So when the teacher starts saying ah for apple, bo for ball, they wonder why ah would be apple, and bo, what's the connection between bo and ball? So they start struggling from the word go. Mm -hmm. In mild cases, they might proceed on with their learning until uh, learning tasks increases. So when words become more complex as they grow up. But again, looking into different types of dyslexia. So children with phonological dyslexia, that's a type of dyslexia that ordinarily affect the ability to learn sounds, will struggle from day one in school. And then we have a type of dyslexia called orthographic dyslexia, where they'll only struggle with writing and then spelling. And so they'll not be picked from early years, because when you're talking to them, they understand everything. You talk of up for up, they understand all that. And that's what is taught in kindergarten. So they'll make good progress up to maybe uh, grade four or even grade five. And that's when they start struggling significantly, when now spelling rules start coming in, reading fluency become an issue, and then you realize that they're not making progress. Mm. In your case, yes. do you have dyslexia in any of the families? Uh, in our family, no, both sides, no. But I had a very difficult pregnancy or through and um, so for us we tend to think that would have been it mm -hmm. yeah because even after birth we stayed in hospital for some time then she had also some medical issues now at what point do you think if somebody is actually keen enough mm -hmm. they would catch it for to enable early intervention all children born at risk need to undergo early intervention, whether there's a problem or no problem to help them pick up from early years. Mm -hmm. And if your instinct tells you that your child is delayed, mm -hmm. don't listen to what people tell you that no, your child is different. Start early intervention. Mm -hmm. But then when they're joining school, and then the teacher tells you your child cannot concentrate in class, your child keeps shifting attention from one activity to the other one, 
keep giving excuses. No, I want to go to the washroom. I have stomach ache. My head is aching. For you to be diagnosed with dyslexia, first of all, means that you have average, above average general intelligence. Yes. So they're intelligent. So they'll come up with lots of excuses. You need to start seeking for help. Find out why. When you think about her developmental stages and her milestones, yes. is there a point where you probably thought milestones are different for every child? Mm. Do you think maybe you missed some of those? I think so. once she, she was dealing with another health issue when she was small. And um, so we kind of felt mm -hmm. we are concentrating more on her health improvement more than even education. Mm. We thought again, maybe she missed a bit of school because she also missed a bit of school. Okay. So we need to intervene there. Mm -hmm. We tried the intervention, getting extra, like an, a teacher for extra few hours to get her to reading. I would read with her, the dad would read, would read with her like every day. And we saw after one year, there's not much of anything changing. Then that's when we thought there's something. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, now, Dr. Ring, mm -hmm. you can't blame her because right. health comes first. Mm, sure. But then again, dyslexia has at times uh, been um, misdiagnosed to be something else because some yeah. of the symptoms mimic other neurological disorders like mm -hmm. autism. How can you tell the difference, especially for a layman? Right. Uh, dyslexia is very specific. That's why we call it specific learning difficulties. If it comes to something like autism, you need occupational therapy, you need speech therapy, you need social skills training. So you find that intervention becomes even wider. But for dyslexia, it's very specific and we also know that the child has average to above average general intelligence. Mm -hmm. So it's easier to work with a person with dyslexia than most of these other neurodevelopmental conditions. Okay, now Lena, mm -hmm. you touched on the fact that your daughter had mm -hmm. issues with concentration. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, attention deficit uh, hyperactive disorder yes. is something that's also associated with dyslexia. Mm -hmm. Did that not trigger anything or you just thought they're just being a child? Uh, initially, we thought they're just being a child. And again, she's very confident. So being very confident, kind of like, masks everything else, every other weakness. Mm -hmm. She comes, she meets you straight on your face, even the teachers. And she was so confident. Even when she's trying to read, she'll even come with a book and try and teach everybody else. Mm -hmm. So you, for you to pick that from such a child, until now, like you were saying, mm -hmm. you know when they get to like grade four and they're doing big awards, they're writing composition, mm -hmm. that was hard. And especially Swahili Insha, that was hard. So you, that's when you start picking that. And also herself, she will tell you, she can notice the other people in class, can read well. So how come I can't read? Such big words. So Lena is saying her daughter is actually very intelligent and good with technical stuff. And Dr. Ari actually said these children are above Average, they're actually very intelligent, but yeah. they need intervention and support for them to live a full life. We talk more about the stigma and the challenges of that in society right after this break. What did you do? Yes, I like dog women and drama. Nothing serious. Nothing serious? 8.5 billion Kenyan shillings is missing, and you're saying it's nothing serious. It's very serious. Look at you. The old story I by Tony after one date. One date. So now you tell me. Do you really think Don is your type? Or you're just passing time with him? Ugali. 
Can I buy a chocolate, please? It's for my mom. Happy birthday, mom. Thank you, Bella. There's a class and a half in everyone. Torecho, kata ni kufigie. In heaven there is no beer. That is why you are drinking. Oh yes, and when Church and Show, in association with Tala at Five. This year, as we celebrate five years with you, we are celebrating five years of transforming Kenyan stories forever. Tala, to Songe Pamoya. You're watching Health Diary, in association with Kemsa. Thank you for staying with Health Dairy. My name is Gladys Kashanta and the conversation today is dyslexia. Now, a lot of information coming out of this conversation I'm having with Lena, who is a caregiver to a nine-year-old daughter with dyslexia, and Dr. Onalo, who is a specialist in the same. And Dr. Terry, before we went to break, we emphasized on the fact that these children are gifted, they are above average, and they do many other things but have a problem with their reading especially and making up words. Now, what what is the problem with the brain in this case if you're saying these children are good at this but they are actually struggling with this? Dyslexia is a neurodevelopmental challenge. That means that they process information in a slightly different way. Mm -hmm. They'll see certain details that you can't see. They'll come up with a lot of creative ideas and information and visual hands-on activities that you can't imagine they can do that. If you look at the business world, most people who are very successful in business, if you look at great engineers you know, and doctors, a big number of them have dyslexia. Yes. And one thing about people with dyslexia is that they don't give up. Yeah, they'll keep trying until we usually say that they're experienced with failure. Okay. Then they get it right. <laughs> Which is a very good attitude in life. Yes, and so yeah. they, they succeed. They end yeah. up succeeding. Sometimes they look at words and letters and numbers and they seem to be flying around. When, okay. like yes. literally? Yeah, literally flying. Okay. Yeah, uh -huh. so you want to write cut and then you see T running to the other side and A running to the other mm -hmm. side and so it becomes stuck. Wow. Yeah, and then like yesterday I was looking at a chance uh, work and uh, he wrote uh, T-O-X, and then I asked him, what did you write? Then he said, Fox. Mm -hmm. So his F was facing the other way, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then he would write Bog instead of Dog. For you, Lena, you say she's very good with techie stuff. She wants to play with the iPad and all that. What other things have you seen that now her strengths are in? She's very creative. She can pick a balloon and design a dress for a doll, you know, and who thinks a balloon can, and she dresses the doll, you know, or picks things, papers, foil, foil paper, and makes things out of it from nowhere. You know, she comes, cuts, and I was like, wow, that's gifting. Mm -hmm. Something else is that she picks flags, and she can tell you that's this country. I don't even know myself. <laughs> that one is this one. <laughs> yes. And your, she would not, the thing is that, I think once they master something, some of them, like what I've seen with my daughter, Sticks. Not everyone has it as easy as Lena's mm -hmm. daughter, right? Mm -hmm. There's some that really struggle through class and that hits on them, on their self-esteem, and that now, of course, with the teachers, mm -hmm. they also give up on them. Yeah. One, one thing that happens sometimes when I interview teachers to get background information about the child is that they'll tell me this child is a slow learner. You've probably heard of that oh, term, yeah. slow learner. Mm. <laughs> yeah. school is mm. not for them. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Uh, it's not working hard, it's a lazy child. Mm -hmm. So before the teacher gets to figure out the child's learning style, the teacher gets frustrated. Mm -hmm. 
So the child is frustrated, the, child is, the teacher is frustrated. So you tell the child, try hard, but the child is trying the hardest. So the teacher needs help to understand that this child is putting in his effort. Maybe the teaching method is not matching the child's learning style. Use multisensory learning strategies, project-based learning will help them. Use short video clips or use demonstration. A big number of people with dyslexia, actually majority of them, end up having very low self-esteem. Mm -hmm. So some of them will drop out of school, they feel they can't make it in life. Mm -hmm. But when you find them in Juakali mm -hmm. garage, mm -hmm. they are the best artisans. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you find them designing clothes mm -hmm. as or fundies out there, mm -hmm. they are the best. Mm -hmm. Only that the school did not meet their learning needs. Okay. Mm -hmm. And speaking of needs, mm -hmm. Elena, what have you put in place mm -hmm. to ensure that your mm -hmm. daughter now is mm -hmm. supported as she mm -hmm. should be? Like us, when we got to know, one, we accepted. Our daughter has dyslexia, yeah. Yeah, which is a very important fact. There are parents who are told, I'm sure he's met some, mm -hmm. who refuse. You know, how do you refuse? Like you've been struggling and here you have a breakthrough. Mm -hmm. There's this issue. So what we have done is one, um, we've talked to the schools, where, where, where the school where she goes, and um, they've been very positive, and she gets lesser workload, yeah, um, not a lot of copying, you know. She, sometimes she gets different homework, because at the end of the day, is her understanding of a certain concept, yeah. you know. Then we make people around us, especially family and friends, to know what she's going through, because you'll find other kids telling her, you can't read, you know? Yeah. So you need to, pro to protect her self-esteem at that, at that point. And sometimes she'll come and tell you, oh, this person said, I can't read or I'm lazy. You know, like what he's saying? Yes. Like I didn't want to do. And mommy, I was trying hard. Mm. You know how that breaks the heart of a parent. Yeah, yeah. But you're thinking about common mwanainchi, who is in a yeah, remote yeah. village somewhere, mm. you know? So fast from the household, things that don't need money intervention, protect that child and their self-esteem. I'm glad she brought up the people in the villages, the counties, Mashinani. Where can somebody go to get the right intervention for their child? We have places where you can go for basic evaluation. The government runs assessment and resource uh, centers, so the former district. So the that is the Ministry of Education started EACS, Education Assessment and Resource Center. So if you're anywhere in the country, you can go to education office in the county where you are, and they'll be able to direct you to the nearest education assessment and resource center. Mm -hmm. They'll be able to do basic evaluation. But then the problem is intervention. Where will that child be referred to? We do not have those programs. So they will probably refer you to a school for children with intellectual disability because you are not fitting in the mainstream classroom. But then when you take this child to the other side, they're also not fitting in. They do not have intellectual disability. Yeah. And they're not fitting in the mainstream, so they're left nowhere. So the parent would then decide whether to continue in the mainstream and the child continues failing. Or take the child to a special school for children with intellectual disability and waste the child's potential. Yeah. So it, it, that's where we are as a country, that we do not have a single program for early intervention run by the government. Our prayer is that every government school, and you're looking at every common Kenyan, you know, that you can be able to go into a, a, a normal school, government school, and get intervention from there. And most of the international schools have support units, you know, where kids can be pulled out and, and put in, they'll go through the mainstream education, even in the international school, but they get sessions where they can come out and, you know, they read with the teachers, they what, and there's a few interventions done there. Then again, they have audio books, you know. Like, for example, I'm a teenage, 13 year old girl. We are reading this novel. I won't feel left out because I can go borrow an audio book, read, and compare with my peers who are reading the book. Mm -hmm. There's also something, uh, tools like a C pen which can read for you. So if we can even have two minimum in every school, where this, when these students are doing, when they're doing exams, the CPEN is a reader. Ah. So it reads for them. And you see, we are saying all of us, all our children should access the same level of education. And then also just the issue about laptops in school. This is where we get to use them. 
you know, where kids, you know, because they can spell check, because they struggle with spelling, yeah. they can spell check, they can, um, they can have programs that speak back, like, I'm searching for this Google, can you get it for me, you know? So that helps a child who is struggling with something, and they'll feel technology has breached this gap, and I'm able to be at power with my fellow students. Okay, yeah. now before we wrap up this conversation, mm -hmm. you need to bust some myths for us in as far as <laughs> dyslexia is concerned. Right. Some people think dyslexia is about reading things backwards. Fact mm -hmm. or fiction? Fiction. Good. Uh, <laughs> there is a connection between dyslexia and mental illness. Fact or fiction? Fiction. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. a person with dyslexia can develop a mental health problem because we say society is the problem. Yeah. If everybody keeps focusing on your negatives, 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 yes. then there will be a problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, and some say it is more common in boys than it is in girls. Fact or fiction? Uh, apparently, yes. Mm -hmm. Boys are affected in all kinds of disabilities than in girls. Oh. How come? Uh, there are so many explanations. One of them is that the Y chromosome is a barren chromosome in men. So it does not carry a lot of characteristics. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, mm. so even <laughs> as we say goodbye, yes. then, uh, what would you like yeah. society to understand mm. in as far as special needs children are mm. concerned, mm. dyslexic in this case, mm. and their caregivers? Support from the education, from the government, Ministry of Education, and support from home, support from teachers, yes, and love in general. Okay, thank you. Very well said. That was uh, Lena Kivuva, caregiver to a nine-year-old living with dyslexia, and Dr. John Omonella, who is a consultant in developmental and learning disability, as we learned more about dyslexia and, of course, some of the challenges those that living with this condition go through, but most so to be aware that the caregivers also need support and they also need to be aware of the challenges the children are going through. Well, time for the health tip. The dumbbell and the kettlebell are great tools for strength training. But if your aim is to lose weight, you should include more of kettlebells in your workouts, like the exercise he's doing right now. He's working on his glutes, the legs, and working on his abs. So it helps a lot in losing weight. When you're doing your back workouts, then you should arc your back and make sure you're looking forward while you're working out on your back. Those are the best tips if you want to build a nice back and a full well sculptured back. This is workout is called bent over rows. This has been Healthy Dairy. Thank you for your company and of course we see your suggestions and your comments coming through on our social media handles. We have been coming to you from the Grandma Suites here in Nairobi. Until next time, take care. Let's start again. Hi, stand by. I'm doing. Health Diary, in association with Kemsa. Kemsa has steadily grown from simple storage handling to an innovative, fully-fledged healthcare distribution service. Affordable healthcare for all citizens.
It's another week. It's Jum Rock right here on NTV. And this coming Saturday, our guest, the Cute Boy Association, will be live in the studio and we'll have a one on one interview. Plus, we'll also be talking to none other than Javada, all the way from Kingston, Jamaica, live on Skype. Yo, 254, watch your man. This is Javada, man. So, yo. Not forgetting all your favorite reggae players from DJ Wiz of the Doty family. Girl, I wanna wake up beside you. See? Man. All this right here on NTV, Saturday at 10 p.m. It's a winning weekend on NTV. We will hook you up with just the right people to help you fix your space. In the quest to have more hair, some women are losing even the little they have. It's common here in Africa. Pre Kenyan music. Ingine yenyu alisikia ni white edition mkakuja na wazungu. Kwanza ni kuna huyu Giana anitangwa smart njoo kani mwandi. Respect. I cannot tell it all. Have a fun weekend on NTV. TV turning on your world. The following program has been rated PG. It may contain scenes unsuitable for children under the age of 10. And welcome to The She Word, the show where we discuss trending topics among women across Africa. On the show today, we have Maya Aluel Kor from South Sudan. Maya works towards creating awareness and educating refugees on their rights. Yee! Excited to be here, shukran. From Eritrea, we have Novel Makonen. Novel has a background in international relations studies and is passionate about human rights, equality and women empowerment. We also have Esteline Abdi Halane from Somalia. Esteline is a photographer, writer, and a passionate social change maker. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for having me. And I am Achieng Maureen Akana, a lawyer and currently the executive director of International Refugee Rights Initiative. I am passionate about the promotion of democratic governance and the protection of human rights, especially in pre- and post-conflict situations across Africa. Welcome to the show, ladies. Thank, Thank you. you. It's good to have you here and good to be with you. Excited. On the show today, we talk about the vulnerability of women in conflict situations. We begin with a sad story. <laughs> I ran away because I feared for my life. I was a journalist. I worked on a story that implicated some soldiers in the rape of women and children. One day, just as I was about to leave work, my driver called me and told me the car had issues and advised I take a public service vehicle or a motorbike. Just as I was about to take a motorbike, I noticed a taxi. So I entered it. But later on, I noticed it only had male passengers. Shortly after this, the men attacked me and blindfolded me. They tied my mouth and hands and then threw me to the ground. Then they beat me. They took everything I had. Then they started undressing me. Then they raped me. They must have been around 10 or more. I was severely hurt. I became sick. 
I used to bleed a lot. The shame and embarrassment of what had happened to me and the fear that people would come after me is what made me run away. I left my child behind. Some of my aunties ran away because of war. Others passed on. There are others whose whereabouts, up until today, I'm not even aware of. It is true my life has changed, and it has changed dramatically. I can say, at least now, it is bearable. Wow, that was really overwhelming. Sad. Chills yeah. all over. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is unfortunately when we talk about conflict zones and especially on the African context, rape is the first thing that women in Africa face. And unfortunately, our society, our community is not aware of rape and consequences. And rape, we always blame whoever is blamed, raped, a woman who's raped. She's blamed for that. I think the sad part is when you come forth as a woman and try to tell people that you have been sexually assaulted, it's the close people to you that tell you no, you, you can't say this because mm -hmm. of the traditions that are there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're not allowed to talk openly about it. Mm -hmm. And many young girls suffer in silence. Mm -hmm. And these people are never brought to books. They never pay for it or act as an example for the story not to repeat itself. And it's very sad that, you know, this, this, the lack of protection is so severe that um, not only do you not get the social support, but even the legal support to be able to uh, seek redress. Um, we've had very much about sexual harassment, even in the camps. Um, people come to seek asylum, to run away from such situations as we watched in the video. And even then, when where they're seeking asylum, there's still no protection for them. Yeah, we really understand that because growing up in Kakuma refugee camp, I've lived there over 20 years, and I know whenever things like this happen, it takes a, lo a very long process. So sometimes you don't, get, you don't go through the, the right channels, and then you feel like you have to keep it to yourself because of society, because of what other people think about. And coming from an African setup, you know, people think about like when you're being sexually abused, like nobody's going to marry you, mm -hmm. nobody's going to respect you. How did you end up at Kakuma? How did you become a refugee? I came to Kakuma at the year 1995 when I was almost five years. So I think being five years old, I don't even know what happened. So I just find myself in Kakuma refugee camp. I stayed in the camp. I'm a single mother. I have a, a teenager and a young girl a proud mother indeed. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> it's really actually really hard being a single mom, being a woman, being a widow. Mm -hmm. The vulnerability, it's in another level. So you have to fight for everything. So I was basically born at the border of Kenya, border of Kenya and Sudan, raised in Kakuma refugee camp. And we're only two girls, my mom. She's a widow also. So it's really hard while growing up, the sexual assault, immediately she hears someone has been sexually assaulted, she gets traumatized. Mm -hmm. She's like, what am I going to do to these girls? Mm -hmm. How am I going to protect them? So you find even our, our movement is limited because mommy is super scared. Made 51 is a project at the Kakuma refugee camp in northern Kenya. Women who have been sexually abused during conflict backed in their countries engage in bead making to help them heal. The project also empowers them economically. The project targets women and girls and boys who were once victim or are at the risk of SGBV. In the business center, we have 101 beneficiaries, and these artisans are drawn from different nationalities. We have South Sudanese, uh, we have uh, Kenyan host. Uh, we have Burundians, we have Congolese, we have Somalis and Ethiopians. We have basketry, 
uh, we have a uh, beadwork and fin finally we have the tailors. Uh, and the, the basketry, uh, Burundians are the lead in basketry because of their traditional skills. Uh, and uh, beadwork, uh, we have the Kenyan host and South Sudanese being what they learn in their traditional. And then the tailors forms the majority of the Congolese. Uh, we are using their traditional skills and connecting them to global ma value chains. On the product produced here, we normally take photos. And the, these photos, not all the photos go to the website. It is synthesized to the level where there is a, a certain quality or specification that is taken to the website. It is through this technology that the other world can know exactly what the refugees are doing in Kakuma. It's actually it is a form of communication to the world that they, there are items produced by the refugees using their skills that can be transformed to something that they will hand them a living. To me, I can say it, is, it has changed their life in the sense that uh, people living in Kalobeye, uh, they are basically surviving on Bamba Chakula, the food that is given by UNHCR to them. So, and these are new arrivals, they, are, they don't have businesses to ride on. But after UNHCR and AHI came up with this project, uh, this change because uh, we normally give them remuneration of the work they, that they, they do. We pay them on monthly basis. Wow. Quite encouraging. Yeah, it is. Exactly. Some of your of your bracelets that you have. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Some of this necklace that I have. Yeah, exactly. Those, this is the way we're supposed to support women. Mm -hmm. I also think for the guys that have fled their country, I, I always like to carry a sense of identity with me mm -hmm. everywhere I go. So I must have a representation of a South yeah. Sudanese somewhere. Exactly, yeah. like the Jitegeme Center in, in Kakuma. Yeah. It's been there like for over 10 years. And these women are doing amazing work. Like they have these bags that they, they, they export over to the USA, mm -hmm. to UK. Like the shirt you're wearing, Achieng, mm -hmm. they make a lot of good stuff. And most of 